as is the silver is all coming from the Greek motherland, from the Aegean. And uh, this is uh, reference data from the Oxford lead isotope database. And in short, the, the red is uh, the Aegean, so silver sources from Macedonia, from Thrace, from Attica, the famous mines of Orion. And all of our coins essentially come from either Attica, from the mines of Orion, or from the mountain ranges of uh, the Rodopi Mountains, from Kalkadiki, and Zanthi being one of those mines in the Rodopi Mountains. But it wasn't quite simply a case of, oh, the silver comes from either L'Oreal or from uh, Kalkadiki, but actually we, we started to see silvers being mixed. We've got these very characteristic mixing lines between two sources, and that was very interesting. Um, but is it all silver? Well, what we found is, no, it's not. As time progresses, the silver purity decreases. And in the earliest phase, we've got, you know, up to 98, 90, uh, even, yeah, not higher than 98% pure silver. But the stuff being added to make the silver go further, to stretch the coinage, so to speak, is actually different alloys of copper. So you have some coins which are as little as 90% silver, even less in some cases, where, adds, where copper has been deliberately added. And it's not always pure copper, it's bronzes, so we're seeing tin being added, and also dirty copper. So when we were provenancing the silver, it didn't uh, it wasn't as straightforward as saying, oh, the silver just comes from the ground here. We're dealing with a very dynamic metal that's going through different stages and recycling and mixing. And uh, what we were able to reconstruct is uh, the silver sources coming from the Aegean, but the copper alloy being added from somewhere. We can't say where exactly. We did try using uh, other methods, copper isotopes, but in short, all we could say is that the silver is being debased with something else. Um, it was quite interesting though for um, some of these colonies, we found the copper isotopes were very, very similar. So the implication was that they're using the same sources of copper, but that's as far as we could go with our interpretation. The bit I want to take you on to now is away from the uh, 500 to 300 BCE period and move on to Rome's rise to power. And this is where it gets quite interesting because the, uh, the historical sources tell us that when Rome conquered Spain, it used Spanish silver. And uh, we were hoping to find something different. We did initially actually find something different. but. Uh, uh, we also learned that Spanish silver was being used. So just to take you all to uh, the map you've probably all, all know in a second, um, I'll take you through the Punic Wars and Rome's expansion, um, and then just to show how this relates to the changes in silver sources. Um, but this silver doesn't necessarily have to come straight from the mines, it can come from war booty, reparations being paid, which are well documented, taxes, and also from uh, trade. Um, as I showed you before, with fineness, uh, one of the indications we're using fineness as, so the purity of the silver is how stable or uh, resilient the economy is. If there is no need to stretch the money, it will be pure. But if there is a need to have greater expenditure, you need to dilute the silver. And 10% copper is very good because you can add that much without changing the appearance or the colour. So it's not actually apparent unless you really know what you're looking for with rubbing tests and things which most moneyers and metalsmiths would be able to detect, but not necessarily your everyday user. So in the beginning, um, it feels a bit um, fraudulent of me <coughs> telling a, a classic audience about the military. <laughs> so I'm not a classicist. Um, we have uh, Rome uh, here with its fairly 
small territory. And during its rise, after the uh, first Punic War, we see that it has already taken over Sardinia. Sorry, after the Second Punic War, which is around 218, it's taken over Sardinia and Sicily. And by the time of the Third Punic War, Carthage has been uh, totally overcome and Rome's territory has expanded to incorporate the whole of the Mediterranean. And what we're interested in is how does this expansion uh, uh, mimic or reflect changes in silver being used for money? And it's, it's not just the metal, it's always the iconography, there's these other aspects which are being dealt with by um, other postdocs at the moment. But what I, I was interested in really is to see how this changes. And so here are um, the uh, more specific uh, uh, locations in question. The, uh, the ones I want to draw your attention to are to the mines in southern Spain. So the IPB is the Iberian uh, Pyrite Belt. And we have the silver mines at Sierra Morena and then a whole mining region here in the southeast of Spain. And here are some of the uh, other mints from the Greek colonies as well as uh, uh, Carthaginian, uh, Carthaginian coins we looked at. And what we found were three different mixing lines. So for the earliest coinage, which I've already covered briefly, it's all coming from the Aegean. And we see that this small little group of coins down here zoomed out. And these two are the same graphs, just different isotopes. And so, no, so this, is, this has already been covered, these earliest, uh, the earliest coins. But what's um, perhaps uh, more interesting and relevant now is this rise to power. We see that Rome is actually using silver from Spain for its coinage after the Third Punic War. So uh, this area is, well, I'll cover it in the next slide, uh, Iberian Belt and then uh, southeastern Spain. The earliest coinage, though, uh, from Rome is actually coming from the Aegean. So as Rome starts, it's using silver being accessed by the Greek colonies from L'Oreal, from Calcadigi. But then as Rome conquers or succeeds against Carthage, it has access to a whole new wealth of silver from southeast Spain. And that's essentially what you see here in, in this mixing line and this mixing line. I'm just going to put these on. Now this looks like a terrible plot because it is. I was still improving it. <laughs> but the, the red points here are the uh, ores from southeast Spain. And then the purple <laughs> ones are from the Iberian pyrite belt. And then we also have these purple ones which are from Sierra Morena. And these are the coins here, the black dots, and they're basically a mixture of silver from South Spain, in short. Silver from South Spain just appears and floods the, the composition of the coinage. And here you can see a little bit better, these are mixing lines, and what we've included now is also ingots and slags, so the byproduct of uh, of lead smelting, because the silver is coming from lead, um, originally Argentinian lead, and they match beautifully with the uh, sources in southeast Spain. And it's not just independent sources, it's a mixture of these two. Uh, one of the reasons for that might be that the silver in uh, southeast Spain is actually um, uh, a form of ore called jarosite. And in order to extract the silver from these primary ores, you need to add lead. And that might have come from uh, 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 the Iberian uh, belt. So it might be that they're adding lead from nearby in order to be able to extract the silver from these other ores. It's difficult to say if it's that or a mixture of, uh, of silver. And uh, what's interesting is if we combine this again with our previous uh, knowledge on fineness, what we see is after Rome has expanded the pure.
purity of the silver doesn't uh, keep decreasing, but it actually returns back to a really high purity. It's around uh, 90, 96 weight percent. That's extremely pure. That's much purer than uh, most silver that's worn today. So once Rowe has succeeded, there is no need to debase the silver any further. There's no need to add copper. This is a reflection of political stability and success in the silver. At least that's how we're interpreting it. It's after gaining access to the sources in Spain that uh, we see this return back to pure silver. So, when we combine this all together, what we see is for the earliest uh, Greek colonies in uh, southern Italy, we have silver coming from the Aegean, but then after the Punic Wars, we see Rome has completely taken over coinage systems. Most of these men ceased to mint coins after around 220. That Rome takes over with the influx of silver from Spain. So, going back to the initial uh, points being made about this talk is that metals are in general so uh, innately tied to urban developments and urban dynamics and this is one of the examples I've put forward to you today is that without this dynamic movement of silver, mixing of silver and acquisition of new silver sources, perhaps this expression and expenditure of Rome's political gains and successes may not have been uh, possible. Perhaps another method would have been sought, I don't know. But money is metal, and that's something we shouldn't forget. It's not just a token or even, uh, in some cases, a pre-monetary form, it is still metal. And that's why it's so important for, uh, for us to realise and not to forget its innate qualities. So now I'm going to take you to the second case study, which is also to emphasise the dynamism and movement of metal networks um, and its importance for uh, settlements and urbanising communities is now in uh, Iceland which is in the North Atlantic and uh, what uh, I'll show you now is a series of uh, finds from crucibles and scrap metal found uh, at different sites all over the country and our question is, is there evidence for production of metal metals in Iceland? Is there evidence for copper production? And if not, where is the metal coming from? Where is it? Um, how is it being used? And most of the stuff uh, that's coming up, non-ferrous, so not iron, is uh, this kind of material, which is heaps of coppery scrap. I don't know exactly what it is until you analyse it, but I can tell you uh, this material, about half of it is pure copper, and the other half is brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc. And uh, this material is associated with these crucibles at one site in the north at Skogar. And um, the crucibles from Skogar are quite big for crucibles. And the reason we were excited was, was, to, was thinking, is there uh, a reason these crucibles are so big? Because at other sites, when you get them this big, it's actually for the extraction of copper from ores on a small scale. So we were wondering, is this then the evidence for primary copper uh, uh, smelting? Um, and there's slags as well being found. Um, the short answer is no, but we'll get to, get to the result in a second. Sadly, very sad. Um, so, in red are the sites from uh, all over Iceland where these crucibles have been found. I've just highlighted in relation to the biggest towns. Um, is regular. And uh, most of them cluster up in the north. Skogar is just up here. And I uh, just want to bring your attention to one potential all source here. And I'll show you in the next uh, slide later on. There's another 
all sorts uh, in the West here. Um, well, not all sorts, but potential all sorts. And uh, what we found uh, again with these other principles is that copper kept coming up and zinc, copper, zinc, and tin, copper, and silver. So there's evidence for the use of copper alloys in these crucibles, um, as well as traces of precious metals. So the uh, crucibles were most likely not for uh, extracting copper, but actually for recycling, re, re melting down scraps of uh, copper, copper alloy, and also even precious metals. And we see this repeated again. Here's another one this time with gold uh, being picked up. And some of these sites are, well, some, about two thirds are associated with religious sites. Hola is, a, is a, one of the early Christian sites in Iceland. Um, and uh, we analysed some of these lumps. I told you earlier we had pure copper and brass, and this other lump that was found in the highlands in Iceland with this one crystal at Kalunga, it's a huge dam now, is also brass with about uh, nine and a half weight percent zinc. And again, we see this being repeated, and uh, sorry, this one's got quite a, a good amount of tin there, so bronze even being remounted down, not just brass. These are X-radiographs here. No, not X-rays, actually, they're neutron uh, radiographs. We can see this very, very dark line here. We can see it better later on. It corresponds to um, the lighter elements. That's actually corrosion products of the metal, of copper. This is another one from uh, downtown Reykjavik. And, uh, these uh, graphs here to compare the metal content from the inside and the outside of the crucible, just so we can establish uh, the increase in, because I mean, the metal's going all over the place, it's filling and there's fuming and uh, what have you. But by comparing the inside and the outside, we can try and see what's more enriched on the inside as a means of understanding what's being uh, remounted or re reworked. Again, we have uh, silver being picked up in these crucibles from, uh, uh, from the north of Iceland, a place called Nost, which means boathouse. And this is still gone. These are those giant crucibles that uh, we thought may have been used for the production of copper. And uh, what we found was this is not copper production. This is reworking and remounting of copper. Here again, those nice lines corresponding to the corrosion products of the metal. And here, you even have the, the pore going over the lip, and this is actually solid metal here. So it's a kind of frozen moment in time of a pore, uh, metal being poured to make an artifact of some sort. Well, why is this important? This is the first review of crucibles from the whole island of Iceland and also the only initial overview of these non-ferrous metals being used in everyday life. And when you uh, put them all together, I don't want you to worry about these elements uh, in detail, but what we got a very clean uh, representation of is that most of it is copper, brass and lead. So the bigger the squares, the, the, the main elements being found. And this is not what we would expect to find from copper production, but actually just from reworking. Um, where is this metal coming from though? Well the obvious uh, uh, answer is it's coming from uh, the Viking homelands, by, by boat of course, but it seems a little bit uh, out of uh, place to assume that it would be entirely dependent on metal.
metals from afar without any attempt to source metals locally. Um, and uh, when we tried to find metal sources in Iceland, what we discovered is that despite looking like malachite, so copper rich ores um, uh, found in these two areas, when we uh, analysed them, we found that there was less than 1.5% copper. And this is green because it's been altered from the parent rock. It's actually weathered basalt, hydrothermally weathered basalt. So these really strong, sulfur rich waters pumping out the ground from the basalt and altering the rock, making these nice green textures, which we've mistaken for being metal rich, and they're not at all kind of natural anomalies. And uh, not just the metal, but the crucibles themselves um, pose a, a, a real, um, uh, what's the word, uh, pose some confusion because in Iceland clay isn't abundant. You don't have plastic clay like you have all over the, uh, the islands and uh, mainland Greece. Uh, Iceland's geologically very young, so the parent rocks, the basalts, haven't had time to weather. Um, and the clay you do have isn't plastic. It doesn't have the adhesive qualities that you need for making pottery, for making crucibles. Um, if you bind it with an organic medium, horse manure or something, you can make something, you can fire it. Um, and perhaps that's what they were doing at Skolga, these big crucibles, uh, hand-formed, uh, lots, lots of them show evidence of breaking even on the first firing. But uh, a few of the crucibles we managed to take samples of destructively, which we weren't allowed to do for all of them, we found some sedimentary rock inclusions. And um, so, for those of you that know Iceland, it is a, uh, a volcanic island, uh, so it's igneous rock, so rocks forming from uh, volcanoes. Um, there's very little in the way of sedimentary rocks uh, whatsoever. So this, for us, uh, was a clear sign that the ceramic being used for the crucible, some of the crucibles, only a handful, uh, were not from Iceland. So these crucibles as well were also being imported into Iceland for use. So in, a, in an environment where there isn't uh, any evidence of uh, mining activity, but there is uh, signs of discoloration which could be mistaken for primary minerals. Um, what do you do? You rely on networks, networks supplying you with metals uh, that you can be used for, uh, for jewellery, for, for pots, for pans, for nails, for boat rivets. But in this case, there seems to be clear evidence of this metal being reused, recycled, and even uh, in some cases brought together to make new ingots. There are some ingots from Skolga, so to bring them back into a, a form for movement, for trade. And that's what we're going to move on to next is the final case study, and we're doing very well for time. I'm going to need to take another 10 minutes off your precious lives. <laughs> it's uh, uh, the medieval uh, period, uh, a bit later now, talking about the holiday period, uh, shipwreck in the Thames. And this is known as the Gresham shipwreck. And uh, what was found in the shipwreck was a lot of metal. Um, in the uh, earliest uh, salvage operations in the 1800s, 1846, uh, boats picked up over 2,000 uh, different metal ingots, 2,700 ingots of iron, of lead, of, of tin. Um, there was uh, excavations uh, recently in 2003 and 4 where they picked up, I suppose you could say the leftovers, a little bit that was left over in the shipwreck, and that included these uh, lading lots. There was three of them. This is one to show you the underside and the top side. It's like a, a bread loaf. And also tinning lots, five were found recently, very long, 
in strips. And then uh, on top of that, uh, these huge iron bars. Um, the capacity of the ship was probably about 150 tons, and uh, it seems that most of the material that was picked up in the 1800s was these uh, iron bars, which have been uh, folded onto themselves like so, uh, left and right, two folds, down to a pack size of around two meters. Uh, it's good for uh, packing on a horse or a mule. And uh, they're, they're around 40 to 60 kilos each. And so what we're interested in with this shipwreck is what does this assemblage, this, this assemblage of different trade forms of metal tell us about the shipwreck, about the voyage or the final voyage of this ship, where was it going to? Where had it come from? And actually this mixture of objects was very nice for us being able to try and put together a narrative of the last voyage and the, I don't know, previous uh, movements of the ship prior to its sinking. And uh, what I showed you before uh, was a uh, lead isotope analysis with uh, silver coins. That also is used here for the lead and the tin ingots to trace their sources. Um, but for iron it's not quite as straightforward. We actually do something called um, slag inclusion analysis whereby you uh, take a piece of your metal object and you cut it up and you make a nice sample block and inside the metal when you look really close microscopic level you'll see in the metal there are still some traces of slag slag from the original production of the iron so you find slag on archaeological sites uh, from where iron was being produced and we can relate the slab from those archaeological sites, from those iron production sites, to an object. And this has been going on now for about 15 years, this, this line of research, and uh, this is what we did on the Gresham uh, bars to see if we could get an indication of their, their provenance. And we did manage to uh, find a rough area and when you combine the results together, this is the uh, narrative that kind of we've put together as the uh, final movements of the ship. Uh, here in the Thames Estuary is the Gresham shipwreck. The other one up here is actually a contemporaneous shipwreck, uh, the Angelude shipwreck, which is a Dutch uh, vessel as well. Um, it's not like the Gresham, I think, in that the Gresham is an armoured merchantman. There were cannons found on board. Um, but it is a shipwreck where there was also an abundance of iron bars found in the hull. And uh, the, the lead ingots um, uh, seem to have been produced in the north of England in uh, Derbyshire, and that's the closest match for the lead isotopes of the ingots. And what's interesting is historical documents attest to a, a huge upsurge in lead production around this time, 1560 to around uh, 1600. And the lead isn't just being produced for metal, but for um, lead oxide, this red coloured powder, which is used in painting, uh, it's known as uh, minium, um, uh, or minium, so there's an upside of lead production at around the same time. The tin, maybe unsurprisingly, is coming from uh, Cornwall, um, probably from uh, St. Day's Mine in Truro. Um, but it's important to note that even though Corn Cornwall is famous for its tin deposits, um, it is not the only source of tin in Northwest Europe. There are other sources. So we have lead from the north of England in Derbyshire and the tin from Cornwall. Um, where's the iron coming from? Uh, well, the nearest area we can relate it to is in the Rhineland, in North Rhineland, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Venue region, so Dutch iron. When we combine this all together, it seems very unlikely that the ship was going back to the Netherlands or the North Coast with Dutch iron. Uh, 
Um, but uh, what we do find is there's historical documents attesting to the re-exportation of iron from uh, the Rhineland from North Germany and uh, also from Sweden. And uh, at this same time in the UK, uh, Britain was producing a lot of iron as well. So this iron in the ship was likely for re-export with British metal products, with the lead and with the tin. And the question is then, where is it going to? There are a series of different possibilities, but we can narrow them down to three likely ones. Um, there is um, uh, other historical documents that attest to this type of iron, known as voyage iron actually, um, being used for as part of the um, trading uh, triangle for the slave trade. And uh, that would have been uh, somewhere on the west coast of Africa. Um, but the other possibility is that this ship could have been sailing for uh, the Levant, especially with uh, lead oxides. But another very likely uh, possibility is that it was sailing for the New World, where we also find lead coming from the UK in places like Jamestown, some of the first uh, colonies on the East Coast who need metals in an environment where they have yet to explore and produce it for themselves. So, this isn't new, this has been going on extensively for a long time and I think that's what's interesting with different metals is that they come in different shapes and sizes and forms and the ones we've just discussed now are all in a form which is quite specific really to, to trade. Bars, ingots, um, loaves, uh, even semi-finished products or uh, uh, yeah, ingots. And uh, this evidence goes all the way back to the Bronze Age. You can see here a picture of the infamous Cypriot uh, uh, oxide ingots with uh, the uh, depictions as well in uh, hieroglyphs. And uh, the question is, why, uh, why are these metals in this form? It's because they're travelling long distances. There is a sign of quality and even uh, standard weight and size. And it's, it's, they're fundamental, really, to sustain and develop communities um, in order to allow them to have the lifestyles that uh, they're used to or, or wish to pursue. And it's because of metals that these elements can also grow bigger, especially with things like the iron bars. They're used for reinforcing structures. By the Middle Ages at this time, they're used for building cathedrals, Gothic cathedrals, which would not have been possible without them. So they are crucial to the, uh, yeah, to the development of urban centres and settlements, but also to rural communities. So, to, to summarise um, and I'll finish up now, I think uh, what I want to stress is that these are three very different case studies I've shown you, a little kind of tour um, of uh, metals being used in different geographical and chronological contexts, but what they share in common is this network arrangement. Um, the movement of this metal and I'm using metal as a general term now, can be in the form of bars, can be in the form of scrap that's been collected, can be in the form of coins, has been uh, shown here to move, in some cases, quite long distances to develop maritime networks, but also to sustain these uh, networks. And in some, case, in some cases, it's because of the networks that the metals have been able to move so far. Um, and I think it's very clear from the first case study with the silver coins is precisely because of access to particular metals, uh, to particular maritime networks, that some powers are able to evolve and develop. So 
Rome's access to the earliest metal from the Aegean is surpassed by this huge influx of metal from Spain in a very pure form and it's because of this change and uh, development in silver sources being used that uh, Rome is able to uh, produce new coinage uh, from uh, silver from Spain but also to, uh, to have a different form of expenditure you know, going from the diluted silver back to pure silver. And uh, in short, what I'd like to sum up with uh, the very last point is that uh, metals are um, used all the time, not just for elite, prestigious objects, but down to the everyday life, the earring, the belt buckle, and uh, they don't just appear like that, they, they, they are at the end of a line of chain events going from the mining to the movement and trade of metals in these forms we've shown until they arrive at their destination. And so metals are uh, significant for uh, a lot of things, but in particular for maritime metals. And that's a big thank you to everyone that I've worked with who've been uh, very, very important in making these projects uh, uh, go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting your perspective. I'm sure there are questions I have a few. Shall we start with the audience? So that 
that Silva um, is arriving at the same level, but then how it's then treated mm. and then minted is, is very different. So what is dirty copper? Uh, not pure. Ah. Sorry. <laughs> It, we, we were very, um, we had a moment 